Hello and welcome to episode 83 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 17th of February 2020. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelan. Good evening. Graham. Saluto. And Will. Hello. So here we are. We had quite a lot of feedback on your Mac exploits, Will, and trying to install Linux on it. Mm. You came up with a really good solution in the end. Yeah, the solution I came up with, and uh, I would recommend this solution to anyone, uh, is to use a ThinkPad. <laughs> yeah, make work change your Mac for a ThinkPad. Yes. Uh, I, so this is a, a 2019 13 inch macbook pro and as far as i could tell at the moment it's basically impossible to get all of the the hardware working properly under linux under specifically ubuntu on this model it's got um hardware driver problems it's got security problems with some t2 chip which um is as far as i can tell a sort of bespoke security chip which uh, mediates access to various bits of hardware uh, and that means that your sound doesn't work your camera doesn't work your touchpad doesn't work the networking doesn't work the bluetooth doesn't work so yeah it's uh it's no good so don't try well do try and if you get it to work let me know but as far as i can tell it's currently impossible and how quickly did you feel at home uh amazingly so i, I felt more comfortable now obviously i have been using gnome for the last whatever five years or something so sure um i am more comfortable with it and i know all the ins and outs of it but it just seems to make more logical sense as well as a uh, it being critical of how the two systems work then i believe that the gnome version makes more sense to people or should make more sense to people all right, well, that's the end of that saga then, I suppose. Let's do a bit of news. And the first one is a plug for a friend of mine, and this is App Center for Everyone. This is something that Elementary are crowdfunding. It is a sprint. They all want to get together in person, and it has been funded already, so I don't need to plug it, although any extra money will be good for Elementary. The idea is to take App Center there, pay what you want App Store for elementary and make it more portable to other distros, which I think is a pretty good idea if they can pull it off. As of today, he's at 128% of his goal with 21 days left. So I think if we could do better for him, I think that'd be quite good because I'm sure he has some stretch goals and stuff he's been trying to work on. So um, be pretty cool. Yeah, you say he is them, that is a team very much. But, I do apologize. But uh, Dan is the kind of boss man. Yeah, I, I'm impressed with how open they've been about how they break down the money that they've asked for. They asked for $10,000 um, and they're sending seven people. That's, you know, that's not a lot of money per person, but they've accounted for it. They've shown they're working. It's a nice, open, uh, easy to understand chart they've put on the, on the um, Indiegogo page. So yeah, good work. Well, a bit of potential good news, and that is that South Korea's government may well be switching to Linux. Yeah, um, it's quite impressive. They've got about 3.3 million PCs that are Windows 7 currently, and they're looking to switch them over to Linux. And that will cost them about 655 million. But you would have to look at that in a long-term prospect that if they could get to that, use local companies, then in reality, that would be a saving because... 3.3 million PCs switching to Windows 10 is not going to be cheap either. Especially when your license key gets lost and then you try to contact Windows support and Windows support <laughs> won't help you because they're share <laughs> bastards. <laughs> I have heard previously from a listener who lives in South Korea that they're very much dependent. I mean, this was a few years ago, so maybe it's different now, but they were very much dependent on Windows to do anything like any sort of online banking. Um, you needed... Uh, the the old browser or whatever. And so it seems unlikely that they will actually do this and more likely that they're just trying to haggle a discount off uh, Microsoft to me. Yeah, this is a very common problem in Linux trying to replace Windows on the desktop. If you were to go to see a government department and discuss replacing their Windows PCs with Linux PCs, there would always be a man from Microsoft or a woman from Microsoft sat at the table in these meetings because they've got so many contacts within these organizations and so many salespeople that they can afford to just send people to meetings um, and you know defend their own technology and so i would expect that there would be somebody from microsoft on the phone to south korea right now trying to talk them out of it and do do them a deal it's a bit tinfoil hatty isn't it <laughs> 
It's not even remotely tinfoil hat enough, though. That's the only problem. I agree. I mean, they haven't even mentioned any distributions that they may be considering. And it, so it sounds like, you know, they've come up with these 655 million US dollars. But where does that come from if they haven't even chosen a distribution? It is very difficult. I mean, that was it the old God, was it old IBM? I'm thinking, was it before nobody got fired for hiring mm. IBM? Um, and you kind of feel the same way in those places, be, be dealing with people that are basically not that technical that they, you know, they can't really get in trouble for hiring the industry standard solution, maybe when, especially when difficult, <laughs> Linux is difficult to kind of understand or understand what you're paying for when everything's free. Not to promote a non-free video platform, but on Netflix, watch Silicon Cowboys about how Compaq kicked IBM in the arse. It's very good. It's funny that we were talking about converting Windows 7 users to Linux and whether that's just pissing in the wind. And now we've got some stats that show that in January, a lot of Windows 7 users upgraded to Windows 10. And it's, it's pretty much, if you look at the graphs of the usage, just a mirror image. And this is from various different uh, sources where they get the stats and publish them. They pretty much all look the same, just the, the Windows 7 usage goes down exactly the same amount as the Windows 10 goes up. So I think the, the likes of um, KDE who were trying it and various other distros, I think it proves that they are largely dreaming, really, if they think that people are going to move over. And um, I read that on Valentine's Day, the fucking FSF sent a hard drive to Microsoft, uh, inviting them to put the source code of Windows 7 and an appropriate license on it and send it back to them. That is kind of cool, epic trolling, though. I mean, they must have been pissed themselves packing this hard drive in there. Yeah. Who fuck knows what they've put on it, though. Maybe it was full of Trojans as well. I was like, yeah, go on. I dare you to plug that in. Yeah, they probably installed Triscoll on it or something. But speaking of Microsoft, they've shared a roadmap for Microsoft Edge. Now, this was only published today by the looks of things. And there is one key part of it. And that is make Edge available on Linux. We knew about this before, but this is proper confirmation that Edge is coming to Linux. And like you said before, Will, this is potentially fairly big for enterprise deployments. Yeah, I would hope that it would allow software developer teams within big enterprises to specify that they want Linux on their desktop, because a lot of them genuinely do, um, and not be blocked on the availability of a specific corporate-approved browser. Um, not that that's the only fly in the ointment here, but it is one less blocker on the road to development teams being allowed to use Linux on the desktop when they want to. All right, KDE Corner then. I think you've got a fair number of links in here, failing. What's going on in KDE land? So a big set of updates that came out last week. Um, the apps were all updated. Um, there is a couple of upcoming ones that will be quite interesting. I'm looking forward to is Keysmith, which is a two-factor auth app for the desktop and mobile. Um, all the main ones got an update and uh, chocolatey support was added for apps, which you might not know about. Um, which is essentially a apt-like repository for Windows, which is quite handy because if you are deploying applications across multiple OSs with something like Salt, you could do a rollout of installing uh, Krita and you could get that installed to any machine that Krita can install to, including Windows, which is quite nifty. The frameworks got, got updated as well. Um, they're getting rid of all the deprecated features, so they're obviously moving towards the the latest version uh, in in thoughts to upgrade to 6, which may or may not happen, or may fork, or God knows what will happen with that. Um, but Plasma as well just got a, re a release the other week, and um, they have got some quite good features, and there's a nice video there to demo a few of them. Yeah, this is 5.18, which is an LTS, which is a pretty big deal. Yeah, it is. It'll be around for next two-ish odd years. Yeah, and it'll be in Kubuntu 20.04 when that happens uh, in April. So quite a lot of people will be using this. But it's not that different from the previous non-LTS release, which you would have been using on Neon, presumably. Yeah, it would have. Um, so, so you don't notice a lot of the big features that way. But I mean, things like notifications have been rewritten. You can get NVIDIA GPU stats in KSysGuard. There's an upgraded theme as well. So if anybody's using Breeze, 
It's got a new adaptable feature, so you can actually use the standard breeze, which is generally a light f- uh, theme, but switch everything to a dark mode color scheme, and it'll actually adapt itself automatically, which is they're trying to iron out, I guess, making things easier to for testing, etc., where they can just have the one theme that can actually do dark or light, um, which is quite good. And things like in the notifications, where if you get a notification of a file transfer, you can drag the file out of the notification pop-up and drop it into another folder or whatever you want to do if you're copying something remotely, say. Yeah, but it does give you that annoying menu. Do you want to copy it here, move it here? That always annoys me when I'm using Plasma. What copy it, move it? What are you doing? You're doing it wrong. Stop holding it wrong. No, like when you when you drag and drop a file from one window to another uh-huh. of uh, what's the the file manager called? Dolphin. Dolphin, yeah. It always asks you, do you want to move it here or copy it here? I see. I was Control X or Control C something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. And it's, I think you can disable that, um, but not by default. And I can't tell you where the configuration option is. It should be more like XFCE, where it just picks one for you randomly. <laughs> is that because it's just one? <laughs> no, sometimes it copies, sometimes it, it moves. And I, I still can't work it out after all these years. Um, like, if it's to a network share, then it generally copies it. But um, if it's, like, within one or two directories of itself, then it generally moves it. I don't know. I'm sure someone will correct me and say that I'm dumb. Do you want your desktop wallpaper to be zero 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 or black? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think updates like this to Plasma, this is something we've kind of talked about before, but it would be brilliant if there was a way to kind of highlight the changes without that actually getting in the way with how you use the desktop. I mean, I know um, Will did this with Ubuntu and, you know, this is what's new and these are and annotating what's changed on the desktop and that works. But there's so many features that I miss because I just don't keep on top of of which version has just been installed. And it's the same with something like Firefox. It'd be great if there's a way of doing that. Well, you just have to read the blog posts. Yeah, I do. And then I forget about it and then things get updated. And then I have no idea those features are there. Yeah. But they've put in the spyware, haven't they? They're opt-in mm-hmm. spyware. <laughs> oh, well, I have enabled it fully. All all my data is belong to them now. That's totally fine by me. Yeah, no, there is a user feedback uh, form that you can do in the control panel. And uh, that will allow you to give whatever level of information defaulting to zero back to the project so they can work out what needs to get fixed in terms of uh, usage and stuff. So Yeah, there's a handy slider, isn't there, from zero by default to just tell you all the things. I tell them all the things. It's such a good open source citizen, you. Absolutely. What else is good about this Plasma release then? Emojis. Oh, yeah. It's like the Windows key and full stop, or period, as the Americans say, brings up the emoji thing. And then it's just one click to copy it, and then you can paste it into wherever. Which seems like a kind of stupid thing, but these days you kind of have to use emojis, otherwise people think you're really grumpy. (laughs) What's an emoji? (laughs) They used to be called smileys, Graham. (laughs) Oh, yeah, colon bracket, I know that. But don't ever put a a minus between your colon and your bracket because then you just look like some sort of old person (laughs) (laughs) i've probably just offended a load of people what's all this about it being buggy then so there was feedback from nate in his usual weekly blog post where he was saying that yes okay they may have added a few more bugs than usual in this release so there's actually an update for that coming out supposedly on tuesday this week so tomorrow or today depending when you listen yeah or three months ago if you're jim salter he's only just listened to the christmas episodes the bastard (laughs) although he did make one of my predictions come true because he wrote about clear linux in uh, ars technica or on ars technica insider trading it was not insider trading it was he said that he was working on it while he was listening to it and that's why he called us out on twitter and called me out um all right so your usual fucking hobby horse K itinerary. <laughs> well, if I was to take said hobby horse, I'd get a ticket, and that ticket would then be able to be installed <laughs> in K itinerary, and I'd be able to navigate my route with it. Um, yeah, I was talking to Dalton in our channel uh, on Telegram, and uh, he said, well, "Of course, you can have K itinerary already. It's in the Android uh, repo for F Droid." And I was like, "You are." So I went out and discovered that there was an entire Android repo for F Droid, which I've linked to that you can get a whole lot of KD apps that I thought were not available. So I was very happy. All right, excellent. So you can get all the KDE stuff on your Googleless Android installation. 
Exactly. And I didn't realise that. I've had it installed for a while, but the thing about the KI Itinerary app is that if you don't have it synced to your PC, you can't tell what it does at all. It's just this endless white space. That is true. But a very cool thing was I booked flights for work uh, for a trip to London. The email came into uh, to contact and in it had do you want to send this to the name of my phone? Because it picked that up. And I said, yes. And then all of a sudden my phone lit up with all the travel details of all that together. And it is very cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I was impressed, I must say. Um, Now it's feature parity with Google Now or whatever that thing was called from about five years ago. (laughs) But hey. (laughs) But the other thing is that we did, there's actually a video from Fosdem that was on was it last week or start of February anyway? And um, it's the main developer of uh, Kaotinary, Volker Kraus. And he has got a cool thing. And I think anybody who has any interest in this should watch it. So one view from you then? Yes, essentially. <laughs> Maybe two. He probably watched it himself to see if he didn't cock up. <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> Okay, this episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash LNL and you can get $50 credit with 30 days to use it. DigitalOcean offers VMs or droplets as they call them with full root access in data centers all over the world with really fast networking and super fast SSDs. And they offer Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, CentOS and FreeBSD and some container distros. But if you don't want to use one of those, you can upload your own custom image. They have loads of one-click apps like LAMP and LEMP stacks, WordPress, Discourse, GitLab, and it's really easy to set up. These droplets start from as little as $5 a month, and they scale all the way up to multiple cores and huge amounts of RAM and disk space. And they also have CPU-optimized droplets if you want just raw power and memory-optimized droplets if you need more of that. They have really simple backups that have saved my bacon once or twice, and cloud firewalls that can stop network traffic before it even gets to your VM. It's really simple to add extra storage to your droplet, whether that is block storage or object storage, depending on your needs. So go to do.co slash LNL and get your $50 credit. That's do.co slash LNL. On to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. Very much appreciated. If you want to join them, you can go to latenightlinux.com slash support for the details. And remember, for $5 or more on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. So go and check that out. And if you want to get in contact, latenightlinux.com slash contact. And I've mentioned extras.show before. That's something that we do at work, uh, random stuff. And I will be publishing my podcasting basics episode in the next day or two. So I'll go back and edit that in. But if you just go to extras.show and subscribe to that, uh, you'll get it. That was basically a version of my OddCamp talk where I talk about you kind of, well, podcasting basics, the room where you're going to record it and how to kind of soundproof that a little bit and different types of microphone and basic post-processing and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in how the sausage is made, then check that out. And uh, another reminder that Foss Talk Live 2020 is going to be on the 20th of June, definitely the 20th of June. Um, and I still haven't sorted out the website and call for papers because I'm just useless. I do have a rough idea of how it's going to work now, I think. And um, there'll be room for a couple of workshops and a couple of hours worth of talks, probably. So um, if you are interested in coming and taking part during the day before the live show start, the podcasts, then get in touch, latenightlinux.com slash contact, or get me on Twitter, Joe Rissington, um, and let me know so we can get some idea. But I, I promise that I will get on this at some point and uh, update the website and sort some proper call for papers out. But yes, 20th of June in London, Fostalk Live, be there and be square, much like Biomon Sci-Fi Con. And don't forget to use Kaya Tinry to get there. Yeah. You said that you'd uh, used it to book a trip to London. I bloody well hope it was Fostalk Live. It was not. I will do that next. He won't be allowed in. <laughs> well, that <laughs> is possible, I guess. <laughs> uh, am I going to see you on this trip to London for work, or are you going to be too busy? Let's see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. It's not looking good at the moment, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, fair enough. 
Last time it was uh, on Eurovision. Or, or I think it was Eurovision Week, and I just had to watch that instead of uh, coming to hang out with you. Yes, so. I'm. I'm not as important. <laughs> Come That's on. fine. Eurovision is, but once a year. I was only there once a year too. Oh yeah. This episode is sponsored by CDN77. Go to cdn77.com. And they are a UK-based CDN provider with an end-to-end video processing and delivery platform as their standalone product called Streamflow. They sponsor a bunch of great open source projects like CentOS, KDE, Fedora, Gentoo, and Funtu. And one of their standout clients is the European Space Agency, who use CDN77 to deliver Hubble images all around the world. They're a real innovation leader. They were the first CDN to implement a lot of new features like HTTP2 and Broccoli compression. And they don't outsource anything. Everything's developed and managed by their own team, including their own DDoS protection. And they can push 80 gigabits per second of live streaming through just one machine through their optimizations. All their servers are running Debian, and the vast majority of them are physical machines with an overall network capacity of more than 14 terabits per second. And they've got 35 points of presence in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with daily peaks regularly exceeding 5 terabits per second. They've got great 24-7 live support and flexible pricing with both great value monthly plans and pay-to-go options. You can get a 14-day free trial with no credit card needed. And if you do stick with them after that, you can get a 40% bonus if you mention Late Night Linux to sales or tech support. So, for example, if you topped up by $1,000, you get $400 on top of that. I hosted the MP3 for an episode of the JRS podcast on CDN77, and it was really easy to set up and link to it and... I had no complaints about the speed from anyone. So go to cdn77.com and start delivering new content. Right, so the Pine phone. This has been hyped quite a lot by quite a lot of people. Now, I ordered one uh, of the Braveheart editions. That has not arrived. But thankfully, I have friends in high places, specifically Lucas from Pine64, who was in London, and I went for a pint with him, and he gave me one. So I have been playing with it. When mine arrives, I've got to give it to someone else, apparently, who he would have given that one to. So yes, I have in my hands a Pine phone. So what do you want to know about it, chaps? Does it feel like a real phone? Yes, it very much does. It feels like perhaps a phone of slightly yesteryear in that you can take the back off it, you can replace the battery. It's kind of things that you would want a phone to do. But when the back's on it and everything, it does feel like a normal phone. And it is a tiny bit thicker than my OnePlus 3T, which granted is not a particularly modern phone at this point. But um, failing, that gives you an idea. It's it's of similar size, let's say, to a OnePlus 3T, slightly taller and roughly as wide and roughly as thin, maybe a tiny bit thicker. Is it also made of Teflon, like the OnePlus 3T without a case on it? It's the slippiest phone I've ever held in my life. No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's smooth plastic, um, but it's not particularly slippery. And there is a case available for it which is just your kind of standard, well, there's a soft one and a harder one, and they're pretty, pretty good. Is that by Pine themselves, the case? I'm not sure on that. I think it's like a partner, let's say. Because I would worry, because, I mean, my phone has died at least 15 times over were it not for an OtterBox case, which, yes, makes my phone look like it is a World War II mobile infantry telephone, but it <laughs> stops it from being absolutely destroyed. That would be the only thing I'd be slightly worried about getting a yeah. sort of non-standard phone. So before I go any further, let me just rattle through the specs here. It's got a 5.9-inch screen, which is 1440 by 720 uh, which is pretty much 720p but taller so it's you know not exactly modern two gigs of ram 16 gigs of emmc storage uh, with the sd card which we'll get back to and an all winner a64 system on a chip so this is a low end device and the price reflects that at 199 dollars so this is not going to win any prizes for being a flagship or whatever what's the camera like <laughs> I wish I knew, Will, is the answer to that. Mm. Because not everything works with the software that's available for it, and there is a lot of different ROMs or images available right now. It's funny that someone said in Telegram that they were looking forward to hearing me talk about it and wondering if there was the, a few apps that I just couldn't live without and so I couldn't move to it. And I had to explain that that is just completely not what this is about. 
this is not a product yet. It's not fair to review it as such because it wasn't sold as a product. This is a development device for people who want to develop for it or do early testing. With that in mind, how easy is it to get an OS on it? And what OS do you put on it? (laughs) Well, it's very, very easy to get an OS running on it, slightly more difficult to install an OS directly on it. As for which ones are available, post-market OS is one option. There are a couple of different images that I think are worth trying. One of them is the Plasma Mobile, and the other one is Fosh. Now, do you know what Fosh is? Is is it a Dutch open source operating <laughs> system? <laughs> <laughs> sure, Fosh, you know, because she comes with the pancakes and the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> no, what if I told you it was GTK based? as a shell. Get it out of here. (laughs) (laughs) What if I told you it was the shell that you get by default on the Librem 5? Uh So it gives you an insight into that, and it is actually quite mature, Fosh. I will give Purism credit there. It is one of the better experiences that you have on the phone, uh, post-market with Fosh, well worth trying. Um. Of course, Ubuntu Touch, that's one of the more mature ones as well. Probably the most usable, although it does have a few bugs in it. Manjaro with Plasma Mobile, which I tried briefly and just, it seemed a bit, well, it's Alpha 3, and it is very Alpha. KDE Neon, which was not very good at all, I'm afraid. Again, that's Plasma Mobile. Also, there's Sailfish OS, which I couldn't get to work. Um, It would go through the the Wi-Fi setup, and then it would just kind of randomly blank the screen when you put your hand near it, as if it was a proximity sensor situation that had gone wrong. Um, Although there is a fully free version of Selfish OS called Nemo, and that is extremely limited, doesn't even have a browser, but was the best in terms of hardware acceleration. It was very smooth with the scrolling, and the, the handful of apps that it has in it seem to work very well. So that, I think, is definitely one to watch because Sailfish, although it's got proprietary bits in it, it's kind of based on Linux and stuff, but um, Sailfish is a very good mobile operating system that, in my experience. And so a free version of it, I'm not surprised that it's doing pretty well. So I think that's one to watch. And there's various others. There's Loon OS, which is based on WebOS, which I tried briefly, which is all right. Um But yeah, the bottom line is that all of the operating systems are immature, to say the least. And there is no way that any of them are daily driver ready yet. That said, there is a lot of development happening with them and a lot of progress. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that progress happens over the next months. But uh, you know, this this is not something that is going to replace an Android phone anytime soon. But I guess this is really for those developers to allow them to do that well exactly it's a reference device that everyone can kind of rally around and port their various os's to and and help each other with the drivers and all the rest of it and you know we've got to the point where you can make phone calls on it i have not put a sim card in it because i don't have a spare one and i am fucked if i'm putting my one in this quite frankly because it's you know it's not usable i need my phone to (laughs) go out with and whatnot And the way I see it, you need to have um, the basics of the UI working properly and and various apps and everything working before you're going to take it out anywhere with you. Well, it's a good thing then that there was a Plasma Mobile Sprint only last week and they were busy working away on all that stuff. So that's good. It'll be finished by next week, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But looking at the hardware, I've got the back of it now. It's got six kill switches uh, and they are modem wi-fi and bluetooth microphone rear camera front camera and headphone jack oh yeah it's got a headphone jack obviously which it it pains me to have to say these days so hardware wise that's pretty cool i it's not something i would find myself using but the the privacy conscious people might use that and interestingly it's got these six pins so i asked lucas on telegram what's these six pins all about and he said that is i squared c and um that means that potentially there could be a keyboard attached to this oh that sounds quite interesting i remember my old nexus 10 had like a load of pogo pins that people used but i just thought you'd use bluetooth or usb well yeah but that 
can be a bit clunky. Bluetooth is just inherently shit, and USB means it's taking up the, the port, whereas you could potentially snap a new back onto this that has the keyboard attached that connects to these pins, and you know it could be like a wraparound thing, or I don't know, this, the possibilities are endless. It's much more integrated to have it via pins rather than USB or Bluetooth, which there's nothing stopping you doing that as well, of course. Another option for for using in the I Square C bus could be like a point of sale device or some kind of um, like field device. The I Square C bus will allow you to connect pretty much well anything you can imagine um, that works on a serial bus could be plugged into this thing. So yeah, you could turn it into a you know a, a touch to pay device uh, for receiving payments. You could turn it into some kind of um, survey device you could plug well i don't know it it could become a mobile terminal more than um than i think people would want to plug a keyboard into it for example you could just weld a tv on the front of it it could be next ubuntu tv (laughs) could be the first ubuntu tv (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure there's prototypes kicking around somewhere so in order to boot an os on this device all you have to do is DD it to a micro SD card, put it into the phone, put the battery back in, and it boots up via the SD card. Oh, that's so nice sounding because yeah, the worst thing about putting Sound Engine Mod or Lineage on a phone is how is this going to brick it and have I picked <laughs> the wrong fucking firmware or God yeah. knows what. That just sounds so good. Like a like a laptop, essentially. How many times do you type fast boot devices and then nothing appears? Oh, God. Yeah, and then you're like, kill server, and like, oh, no, fuck's sake. No. And download that one utility that only runs on Windows 3.11 for work groups, just so you can fucking unfuck it. Pseudo ADB devices. Bastard. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, some of the images like uh, Nemo and Sailfish, you have to run a bash script, and it basically just DDs it for you. Um but most of the others, like Ubuntu Touch, it's just an image file, DD it onto the card, and it just boots with it. I really hope they don't change that for the future one when they actually have the, uh, the non-Braveheart edition, essentially. That would be so good to have it like that. Well, I think that if your SD card isn't bootable, then it just boots from the internal storage, which isn't the fastest in the world, but... Um, to be honest, isn't actually much faster than the SD card in my brief tests that I did. Because here's the thing, if you want to install anything on the internal storage, what you have to do is boot off the SD card and then put the image onto the SD card and DD it over the internal storage (laughs) on the phone. So it's somewhat clunky. But at least it's straightforward and it doesn't require Mm. fucking rescue images and all sorts of things like that. Yeah, it is very straightforward, and it's very Linuxy, and that is the whole point of this thing. the The images that you're running on it are running mainline kernels. That's that's the whole point, and there are some blobs required for some aspects of it, but it is very much a Linux phone rather than an Android phone. In fact, as far as I know, there is no Android ROM available for it yet. If anyone knows of one, please tell me, because I really want to try it as a reference to see how Android runs on this thing. But otherwise, the only operating systems you can run on the phone are proper Linux, for want of a better word. And then I imagine you could probably run Anbox on them (laughs) if you need those applications. Well, yeah, Postmarket announced today that they're working on that. It's not fully working yet, and I think they said it's only x86, so there's a way to go, but they are certainly working on it, which is very promising. Because Postmarket, which is based on Alpine OS, which, as we know, is the tiny uh, kind of container distro, seems like a reasonable base. And they plan to support it in the very long term because they don't like e-waste and everything. So to have that as well as Ubuntu Touch as two potentially very solid options to get proper Linux running on it is, is good for the future. And I'm glad that I've got this now because when the product actually ships, when they start selling a a proper product of it obviously it's all open source ubuntu touch and post market so i'll be able to try the the final image of it because i think there may be some slight hardware changes but i think the system on the chip is going to stay the same so i would very much hope that the the final image that ships will be available and then i'll be able to have pretty much a uh, a retail phone experience and i will definitely be reporting back on it but I just think it's unfair to review it now because it's it's not a product. 
I actually expected you to say some pretty bad things, um, but I'm, I'm actually quite excited about it. Genuinely, just the thought of having a cheap phone I can experiment with different OSs on sounds quite an, intriguing. Well, yeah, it's it's for people who like to mess with phones, essentially. It's it's not supposed to be a daily driver yet. And the, the goal is for it to be a daily driver for people who like to tinker. But I don't think that anyone involved is seriously thinking this is going to take on Android or iOS. It's it's not aimed at that. It's aimed at people who want to run Linux on a phone, who accept certain compromises will come along with that. I have to buy one now. Well, if mine ever turns up, um, th there's someone I'm supposed to give it to, but I'll have to speak to Lucas and see if I can, uh, it, if it turns up before Fast Talk Live in uh, five months or whatever. <laughs> Because that, that's the thing, like, I'm, my experience has been pretty shit, to be honest, with the, the shipping. And I said that I was going to say that. And he said, well, I, you know, say what you want. But here, take this free phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, which softens the blow. But if you've bought one and are still waiting for it, then it must be really fucking annoying. And he said that there's only a very small number of phones that uh, were destined for the UK that haven't been delivered yet. Um. Uh, maybe it's because I live in the the middle of nowhere, the back of beyond in uh, London. Yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe it's stuck at customs or who knows what. But uh, I, I got a notification on the 20th of January and a tracking number from Royal Mail and just nothing has happened ever since. So who knows? Two weeks quarantine. Well, yeah, I did think that that might have something to do with it, but I don't know. Does it run hot? Any ideas on battery life? It does run quite hot. I tend to run it with the back off because it's just easier to swap the SD cards out if you're trying different ROMs all the time. And the big metal kind of heatsink where the system on the chip is does get too hot to touch. If you've got the back on, then it feels warm. And battery life kind of depends, really. There are builds of Ubuntu Touch now that tout 12 hours. I think that's with Wi-Fi off. I haven't tested that, so I don't know. There are some bugs where if you turn it off and leave the battery in, then it can drain it. I, I, I don't know. I've had it mostly plugged in, to be honest. Sounds like power management is still a big issue for it. Yeah, and just drivers generally are a big issue because, like I said, I didn't get the camera working. There may be some images that have working camera, and I don't think I've got the speaker to work. It, it just feels very early. And it just really demonstrates how difficult it is and how much work goes in to porting your operating system to a new device. And it explains why Android devices never get any fucking updates because it takes so much effort and expense to make it work in the first place that updating it, it just makes that work even harder. Yeah, but it does sound like once you have it, you're pretty much there. And I don't think we should give excuses to lazy hardware companies that don't want to release updates. Oh, no. I think that, yeah, it's probably a lot easier to update it once you've uh, got it working. But then, you know, it, updating the kernel is what gives you a lot of problems. But thankfully, this is supposed to be running the mainline kernel, which makes it a lot easier. I, I believe, anyway. I don't know. I'm not a developer, but that's my understanding. So all in all with this thing, I'm glad I've got it. It's not much use at the moment to me personally. It will become much more useful in the future. And I look forward to the day that I can at least use it as a second device maybe. And it's worth me picking up a pay go sim or something to put in it. Yeah, I, I'm hoping it can be my main phone to be quite honest. Because, you know, if, if they can tweak the, all the power management settings and not have to run a, essentially a JVM, I think it could be as quick as an Android phone. But fingers crossed. You're a dreamer, Fanny. I'll give you that. <laughs> I am absolutely a dreamer. That is true. Yeah, but you're not the only one. I don't know any more lines. <laughs> I can't even come back at anything because, you know what, I'm happy with that. That's fine. <laughs> right, well, we better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks when who knows what we'll be talking about. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Venom. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later.